Lecture 9 is devoted to the problem of text typology. The problem of text types offers a severe challenge to linguistic typology. That systematization and classification of language samples as communicative units. And descriptive linguistics, typology focused on minimal units such as phonemes, morphemes, etc. In transformational grammar, typology concentrated on a set of patterns of basic sentences and the rules for building other patterns. Traditional grammar used categories like declarative, interrogative, imperative, and exclamatory, or process, action, judgment, and identification while differentiating sentences into types. Functional grammar offers process, action, feature classification. The usual typologies of sentences can't offer a means of classifying the text as occurrences in communicative interaction. Another approach is the construction of cross-cultural typologies for languages of similar construction. However, all these typologies are devoted to virtual systems being the abstract potential of languages. If sentence typologies are simple but sterile, text typologies are dauntingly vast and subjective. Attempts to apply or convert traditional linguistic methods failed to meet the special needs of a typology of texts. We might count the proportions of nouns, verbs, etc., or measure the length or complexity of sentences, but without really defining the type. We need to know how and why these traits evolve. The fact that Advertising texts have an abundance of adjectives and the news reports have lots of verbs may provide a statement of symptoms for deeper lying tendencies but certainly does not explain the types themselves. Statistical linguistic analysis of this kind ignores the functions of text in communication and the pursuit of human goals. Presumably, those factors must be correlated with the linguistic proportions. A text typology must deal with actual systems. The major difficulty in this new domain is that many actualized instances do not manifest complete or exact characteristics of an ideal type. The demands or expectations associated with a text type can be modified by the requirements of its analysis in a discourse context. The landmark and the study of the typology of text was a conference held in 1972 at the University of Wilford, Germany. It brought new issues to light. Linguists began to think that a typology of text should be correlated with the typology of discourse actions and situations. Unless the appropriateness of a text type to its setting of occurrence is judged, the participants cannot even determine the means and extent of upholding the criteria of textuality. For example, the demands for cohesion and coherence are less strict in conversation than in written texts. Moreover, in poetic texts, cohesion can be sporadically reorganized along non-conventional principles. If these various types we are presented in inappropriate settings, communication will be disturbed or damaged. It might be more productive to study text types from the standpoint of evaluation, evolution, and usage. 
textual typology is indispensable from social and pragmatic factors as well as linguistic factors proper. Bokrand offers the following list of such factors. A differentiation of social settings and participant roles leads to differentiation of situational types. This entails that the differentiation of situation types engenders reliance upon those tech types which are supposed to have greater relevance. The accumulation of knowledge about situations and texts fosters expectations about what's acceptable and effective in a given context. People build their own strategies to fit those expectations and to control textual currencies accordingly. The priorities of control result in the relative dominances of surface features such as word class proportions and syntactic complexity. These surface dominances gain the status of heuristic patterns against which new texts can be matched. And finally, the patterns may exert influence back on the control strategies applied to situation management. In this view, text types cannot be defined independently of pragmatics. People use text types as fuzzy classifications to decide what sort of occurrences are probable among the totality of the possible. As such, the text type can be defined as strictly as considerations of efficient applicability allow. Two approaches to the typology of text are readily evident in linguistic literature. First, one could begin with the traditionally accepted text types such as narrative, descriptive, argumentative, literary and other types of text and seek to define distinctive traits for each. And second, one could undertake to define a serial text independently and then observe whether one obtains a workable typology. The issue may have to be resolved by a compromise. In the development of a text theory, the applicability to text typology should be envisioned such that traditional types become definable. When speaking about the typology of text, first of all, it's necessary to define what the term type means in linguistics. Bogrand and Dressler define a text type as a distinctive configuration of relation and dominances existing between or among elements of the surface text, the textual world, stored knowledge patterns, and the situation of occurrence. The relevant dominances can apply to elements of any size according to the circumstances. Without stipulating exactly what a text must look like for a given type, these dominances powerfully influence the preferences for selecting, arranging and mapping options during the production and interpretation of the text. We can certainly obtain fuzzy classes of texts among which there will be mutual overlap. Some textual traits will be domain-specific, that's peculiar to the situation, topic and the knowledge being addressed. Some traditionally established text types could be defined along functional lines, that's according to the contributions of text to human interactions. The main types of text in this respect are descriptive, narrative and argumentative texts. Scholars have been able to identify some dominances for these types of texts, though without obtaining a strict categorization for every conceivable example. 
Thus, the major functional semantic types of tags look like this. The first functional type of text is represented by descriptive texts that are utilized to recreate or visually present a person, thing, place, event, or action so that the reader may mentally picture that which is being described. Therefore, Descriptive texts aim to create a mental image of the particulars of a story, experiment, situation, and other things. Let's consider the beginning of Drazer's story, The Lost Phoebe, which in my opinion represents a classic example of descriptive text. I'll read the text. They lived together in a part of the country which was not so prosperous as it had once been, about three miles from one of those towns that, instead of increasing in population, is steadily decreasing. The territory was not very thickly settled, perhaps a house every other mile or so, with large acres of corn and wheat land and fallow fields that had Odd seasons had been sown to Timothy and Clover. Their particular house was part log and part frame, the log portion being the old original home of Henry's grandfather. The new portion of now rain bitten, time worn slabs through which the wind squeaked and the chinks at times, and which several overshadowing elms and the butternut tree made picturesque and reminiscently pathetic, but a little damp, was erected by Henry when he was twenty one and just married. That was forty eight years before. The furniture inside, like the house outside, was old and reminiscent of an earlier day. And the text unfolds in this way, the author describing further in details the interior of the house, the orchard with its old age trees, and so forth, thus depicting a verbal and at the same time the mental image of the setting against the background of which the plot of story develops. And the description is done so masterfully that, without it, it would have been impossible to create a psychological portrait and tragedy of old Henry, the main hero of the story. As some scholars claim, Description is more than the messing of details. It's bringing something to life by carefully choosing and arranging words and phrases to produce the desired effect. Descriptive writing may be found in other types of text frequently, as it is one of the most widely recognized modes of writing. Linguists indicate that the most appropriate and effective technique for presenting description is a frequency of conceptual relations for attributes, states, instances, and specifications. The surface text should reflect a corresponding density of modifier dependencies. According to Bogrand, the most commonly applied global pattern of descriptive text is the frame, which in linguistic literature is defined as a coherent structure of concepts that are related in such a way that, without knowledge of all of them, one does not have a complete understanding of the target situation or whatever it might be. Another functional type of text is a narrative text. Narrative texts are utilized to arrange actions and events in a particular sequential order. A narrative is a story that's created in a constructive format as a work of speech, writing, song, film, or other things that describes a sequence of fictional or non-fictional events. The word derives from the Latin verb narrare, 
that means to recount. The word story may be used as a synonym to a narrative, but it can also be used to refer to the sequence of events described in a narrative. A narrative told by a character can be incorporated within a larger narrative. There are two types of narrators or narrative modes, first person and third person limited or omniscient. Generally, a first person narrator brings greater focus on the feelings, opinions and perceptions of a particular character in a story, and on how the characters views the world as well as the opinions of other characters in the story. For instance, we can observe all these characters of narrative text in Butterflies, a two-page story by Roger Dean Kaiser. I'll read only the beginning of it. There was a time in my life when beauty meant something special to me. I guess that would have been when I was about seven or six years old, just several weeks or maybe months before the orphanage turned me into an old man. I would get up every morning at the orphanage, make my bed just like the little soldier that I had become, and then I would get into one or two straight lines and march to breakfast with the other boys, twenty or thirty boys, who also lived in my dormitory. After breakfast, one Saturday morning, I returned to the dormitory and saw the house parent chasing the beautiful monarch butterflies who lived by the hundreds in the azalea bushes strewn around the orphanage. I carefully watched as he caught these beautiful creatures, one after the other, and then took them from the net, and then stuck straight pins through their head and the wings, pinning them onto a heavy cardboard sheet. How cruel it was to kill something of such beauty. I had walked many times out into the bushes all by myself, just so the butterflies could land on my head, face and hands, so I could look at them up close. When the telephone rang, the house parent laid the large cardboard paper down on the back cement step and went inside to answer the phone. So, the story continues like this, the narrator giving account of the events that happened that day in the orphanage, and the feelings and experience he got on the same day. If the writer's intention is to get inside the world of a character as it was seen in the above-mentioned story, then a first-person narration is a good choice. Although a third-person limited narrator is an alternative that does not require from the writer to reveal all the details that a first-person character would know. By contrast, a third-person omniscient narrator gives a panoramic view of the world of the story, looking into many characters and into the broader background of a story. A third person omniscient narrator can tell feelings of every character. For stories in which the context and the views of many characters are important, a third person narrator is a better choice. For instance, Dreiser's story, The Lost Phoebe, represents a third-person narration with an omniscient storyteller recounting the events in a sequential order and the settings that are described so masterfully. Most linguists, studying functional types of text, indicate that in narrative texts, there is a frequency of such conceptual relations as cause, reason, purpose, enablement, and time proximity.
The surface structure of the text should reflect a corresponding density of subordinating dependencies and the use of past, present and future tenses as well as the perfect forms that helps to create the continuum of the narration. The most commonly applied global knowledge pattern in narrative text is the schema, which is a mental construct of reality as culturally ordered and socially sanctioned. The third functional type of text is represented by argumentative texts. They are utilized to promote the acceptance or evaluation of certain beliefs or ideas as true versus false or positive versus negative. Generally, argumentation theory studies how humans should can and do reach conclusions through logical reasoning. Typical argumentative texts have a three componential internal structures which comprises the following elements a set of assumptions or premises, a method of reasoning or deduction, and a conclusion or point. An argument must have at least one premise and one conclusion. In argumentative texts, classical logic is often used as the method of reasoning so that the conclusion follows logically from the assumptions or support. In order to substantiate this statement, we again refer to the text about the crisis of welfare of elderly population in Western Europe. The text has the following argumentative organization, making claim, counterclaim, evidence of counterclaim, and alternative ways of tackling the issues. I'll read the text. All Western countries face a crisis in coping with the demands made on welfare provision by the growing elderly populations. The problem of resource scarcity is a real one. But perhaps not all countries have adopted so rigorously as Britain the view that care should be based on the family model. Scandinavia, for example, provides residential facilities for elderly people not wishing to remain at home or live with their families, and those facilities are often available for use by local pensioners on a daily basis. Elderly people in the United States have developed communities of their own, supporting each other and running them by themselves as their answer to increasing dependencies. Some have argued against these age-dense solutions, likening them to ghettos, but Research suggests a high degree of consumer satisfaction. These examples from other countries clearly demonstrate that there are alternative ways of tackling the issues of curing and dependency and that the family model of cure with high demands made on women and lack of choice and frequent loneliness for the dependents is not the only solution. Accordingly, argumentative texts abound in conceptual relations such as reason, significance, volition, opposition, value, etc. They will also contain a density of evaluative expressions and quantifiers, qualifiers, I'm sorry, words or phrases expressing the speaker's degree of force or certainty concerning the claim. Such words and phrases include possible, impossible, probably, certainly, presumably, as far as the evidence goes, necessarily, etc. For instance, the claim, I am definitely a British citizen, has a greater degree of force than the claim, I am a British citizen, presumably. 
argumentative texts often show cohesive devices for emphasis and insistence, such as recurrence, parallelism, paraphrase, and so on. The most commonly applied global knowledge pattern in this type of text is the plan for inducing beliefs. There are also literary, scientific, didactic, and other types of texts. Literary texts contain various constellations of description, narration, and argumentation. We therefore need some other distinguishing criteria. As Bogrand proposes, the most comprehensive definition of a literary text might be the following. A text whose world stands in a principled relationship of alternativity to the accepted version of the real world. This alternativity is intended to motivate insights into the organization of the real world, not as something objectively given but as something evolving from social cognition, interaction, and negotiation. Literary text words often contain discrepancies which sharpen our awareness of discrepancies in the socially accepted model of the real world. However, even literary trends such as realism, naturalism, and documentary art, we are curious extended to make the text world match the real world, consider the text world as still not real, but at most exemplary for an alternative outlook on reality. Poetic texts would then be that that subclass of literary text in which alternativity is expanded to reorganize strategies such as sounds, syntax, concepts, relations, plans, and so on, for mapping plans and content on the surface structure of the text in such a way that the resulting insights should be correspondingly richer. Scholars categorize poetic texts into three distinct types. The narrative poem or poem that tells a story, the epic poem or a long narrative poem on heroic subjects, and the lyric poem in which a poet or speaker expresses some emotional state. Literary and poetic texts could be seen in opposition to text types intended to increase and distribute knowledge about the currently accepted real world. Scientific texts serve this purpose in their attempt to explore, extend, or classify society's knowledge store of a special domain of facts by presenting and examining evidence drawn from observation or documentation. Didactic texts do not reach beyond society's current knowledge store, but aim to distribute established knowledge to a non-specialized or learning audience of text receivers. This intention requires the presentation of more abundant and explicit background knowledge than is customary in scientific texts. In didactic texts, the textual world must be presented by a process of gradual integration because the text receiver is not assumed to have the suitable background knowledge that a scientific text would require. Therefore, the linkages of established facts are of problematic and eventually of problem-solving nature. Even within this modest typology, we can see that all text types cannot be explicated along the same dimensions. Whereas there might be dominances of concepts and relation types for descriptive, narrative, and argumentative texts, the concept and relation types in other textual types are probably domain-specific. 
Moreover, description, narration, and argumentation will be found in various combinations in other text types. And finally, if text types are dependent upon situational settings, the basic question is how people use cues to assign text of various formats to a given textual type. Thus, the issue of text types is one of the global processing controls, both in text linguistics and in text analysis. People are probably able to utilize text without identifying the type, but efficiency suffers. And the result, the mode of interaction of the writer and the reader, or the speaker and the listener, remains vague. That's all for this lecture. Thank you for attention.